Shakira was infamous because Shakira was a killer. Allegedly killing up to 17 people by the time she was 17 years old. Killing up to 17 people by the time she was 17 years old. In the intricate tapestry of Black America, there exist narratives often overlooked, voices seldom heard, and lives shrouded in the shadows of societal neglect. Such is the tale of Jakira K.I. Barnes, a young woman from Chicago's South Side who emerges as a compelling emblem of these obscure stories. Her life, marked by the raw realities of inner city struggles, and the tumultuous world of gang violence offers a profound glimpse into the complexities of black America. Today's episode of Fear of the Black Messiah, we delve into the captivating journey of one of Chicago's most ruthless killers, 17-year-old Jakira K.I. Barnes. On January 21st, 1997, Jakira Barnes was born in a world fraught with adversity. Raised in the heart of Chicago's notorious South Side, she was no stranger to the harsh realities of inner city life. Jakar wasn't always the killer she turned out to be, having lost her father to gun violence before even turning one. Jakar went on to excel at school and had aspirations of being a social worker. But being from one of the deadliest neighborhoods in arguably America's deadliest city, Jakar would succumb to the street life, eventually participating in, if not tipping the first domino in the most lethal game of freeze tag that took the city of Chicago by storm. That deadly game of freeze tag would give birth to drill rap, an entire rap genre in Chicago quickly affecting the rest of the country and eventually the world. Turning some into stars and others into, well, t-shirts. But first, let's go back and try to understand how we got here. The Great Migration saw millions of black folks moving from Jim Crow South, seeking better opportunities in more industrialized parts of America, Chicago being one of them. By the end of the 1940s, nearly half a million black folks lived in Chicago, mostly in a small quarter called the Black Belt. As the black population increased, so did the white supremacist recipes to disenfranchise foundational black Americans. Step one deny home loans to black Americans so they can't move into white neighborhoods. Step two, take a single black family, move them into a white neighborhood. After, go up and down the block telling the neighbors that a black family has moved in. Make sure to mention that if they don't sell their property, their values will go down. If that doesn't get them to sell, tell the lady of the house that she might be SA. That ought to do the trick. Step three, buy that house at a lower price. Step four, sell that house to a black family at an inflated rate and don't forget to add in a high interest rate. You were either kept out or priced out. This cocktail created a swell of concentration in the city, namely the South Side. With overcrowding came the deterioration of black neighborhoods. What was the government's answer to this problem? Public housing. But due to neglect and poverty, by the 1970s, the public housing became as bad as the deteriorating homes that they were trying to get away from, birthing gangs like the Black Disciples and the Gangster Disciples. Due to the decline of funding of these public housing communities, the members of these communities were left to fend for themselves. The Chicago housing authorities refused to maintain them, making way for some pretty dangerous circumstances. Like the Robert Taylor Homes, which had over 28 buildings and stretched over four miles, and one of, if not the most notorious housing project in America, Cabrini Green. Now, if you're not familiar, I'll let you look it up on your own. Just know that one of the scariest horror franchises made Cabrini Green its setting, Candyman 1 and 2, and I still won't say his name three times in the mirror, but I digress. By the 1980s, the jobs that lured migrators from the South had all but dried up. By the 2000s, Chicago decided that they had made a mistake with public housing projects and decided to tear them all down, giving displaced black Chicagoans Section 8 vouchers that were only honored in the city's South and West Side. This created a haven for gangsters and hustlers where crime was rampant. Allegedly, one of those gangsters was the father of Jakara Barnes. Now I say allegedly, because according to Jakara's mother, 
he wasn't a gangster. But that still didn't stop him from getting murdered with an AK-47 when she was only one. Jakar's family has settled down on 63rd and St. Lawrence on the city's south side, around the corner from Parkway Gardens, a housing development that Michelle Obama grew up in. At an early age, Jakar was exposed to death. This would further expand as she would witness one of her brothers being unalive in front of her at an early age. In spite of the early death she was exposed to, Jakara flourished in school until her ninth grade year when teachers say she withdrew from achieving academic success, eventually getting into fights and hanging out on the block a lot more, where the gang violence eventually engulfed young Jakara. 63rd and St. Lawrence was primarily a gangster disciples territory, also known as GD and their beef with the Black Disciples dates all the way back to 1989, but it wasn't always like that. Here's a brief history lesson. In 1968, two rival gang leaders, Larry Hoover of the Supreme Gangsters and David Barksdale of the Black Disciples Nation, merged their two street organizations into one, making them the Black Gangster Disciple Nation. Their main goal of starting the organization was to fight off racist white gangs like the Uptown Rebels, but they would eventually evolve into drug and gun distribution throughout the city and nation. These activities led to the incarceration of Hoover for murder. David Barksdale died from kidney failure. Although incarcerated, Larry Hoover still ran the gang from inside but began to focus more on the gangster disciples side ostracizing the black disciples. This caused a split between the two gangs, fueling beefs and murders, further exacerbating tensions between the two. By the mid-2010s, almost all leadership and OGs were locked up, further splitting the gangs fractured into sets, mainly neighborhoods or offshoot gangs within the gang. Jakaira Rep STLEBT, the abbreviations of the street names St. Lawrence and Eberhardt, their main rivals was the BD set that dwelled in the Parkway Gardens, also known as Wick City, but not for long. This will all change with the death of Shondell Tuka Gregory, a beloved member of STL EBT. Tuka was also close to Shakira, with the two growing up together. Allegedly, Tuka was killed by an OD Perry, but Tuka wasn't the first STL EBT member to allegedly fall victim to OD. He also allegedly was responsible for the murder of a Jeremy Marshall, the cousin of a high-ranking STL EBT member. But it was Tuka's death that allegedly sent this young woman on a rampage, allegedly being linked to, if not the perpetrator, of 17 unalivings before the age of 17. STL EBT renamed their hood Tukaville in honor of their slain comrades, but the death of Tuka wasn't where things ended. Their ops, short for opposition, constantly used social media to disgrace the young man and taunt their rivals. To further make matters worse, the death was constantly taunted in rap songs by artists like Chief Keith, who would constantly use it to disrespect them, and it was blowing up too. On August 10th, 2011, STL EBT celebrated the birthday of Tuka, their fallen soldier. Later that night, police would find the bullet ridden body of O.D. Perry by his neighborhood, Parkway Gardens, unalive. At this time, Parkway Gardens was nicknamed Wick City. This might have been one of the most impactful deaths in Chicago and the drill rap community as it spawned the unofficial name change of the neighborhood from Wick City to O Block. The name O Block is so infamous that up until recently, you could Google Parkway Gardens and O Block will be the name shown on Google Maps. Now there was a lot of speculation as to who the gunman behind the killing was, but according to police, an eyewitness identified 14-year-old Jakira and another black male to have carried out the ambush. OD, who was known for carrying a 357 Magnum that would later be seen in pictures online with Jakira. She went on to be known as KI and also Lil Snoop 
named after the female killer from HBO's hit show, The Wire. Jakar would soon come to realize that the street rules go both ways and would experience a heartbreak that set her down a darker path with the death of her close cousin, Taekwon Tyler. The saddest part about this story is that Taekwon's mother had moved them out of the hood to the suburbs to get away from the senseless violence, and he ended up losing his life when a gunman sent shots into a group of youngins. Taekwon was really close to Jakaira, and this turned her heart even colder. Overnight, Jakaira turned into a monster, changing her online presence to memorialize Taekwon, going by the name Taekwon Assassin, and that's exactly what she embodied. So, STL EBT and O Block were going body for body, and on September 25th, 2012, Jakaira ends up getting jumped on a train, which is seemingly uneventful. But this jumping sparks a relationship with one of her attackers, Davon Bennett, also known as King Von. Yes, that King Von, the demon from O Block, but that's a whole nother story. And it's almost poetic, eerily poetic. These two known killers from rival neighborhoods, rival sets, rival gangs playing a cat and mouse game with each other's lives. And the story gets even crazier in a bit. But it all starts with K.I. getting jumped on the train. Allegedly, Davon punches K.I. multiple times in the face. Afterwards, he hops on Twitter to brag about it. In response, K.I. tweets her status, letting everyone know that she's a little banged up but she's still good. But then she takes it up a notch threatening gun violence. Days later, KI and other STL EBT members jump an all block member on the train. And like Davon Bennett, she hops on Twitter to let Von know what happened, directly adding him. And King Von responded to the tweets, but not in the way that you would imagine. Essentially, he says, Kyra ain't no lame. And I think I love her. <laughs> Dog, you really can't make this stuff up. Vaughn starts to pursue K.I. playfully online, telling her how he would treat her right. He even began DMing her directly, and at first, Jakaira wasn't going for it. But eventually, she began to soften up to the known killer, asking if they were trying to kill her, with Vaughn responding that they were, but that wasn't what he was on, saying, I don't think I can kill you. You seem cool as hell. Telling her that if he did want to unalive her, that he could have done it while on the train, as he was armed. He went on to tell her that after their crews were done beefing that they could be together. And they continued their banner, that is until Jakaira and her crew caught King Vaughn and his best friend at the entrance of Old Block, where Vaughn was shot in the leg and eventually him hopping on Twitter saying that he didn't have to get shot for them to be cool. His best friend flat out tweeting that he was going to unalive her. Vaughn and K.I. continued to tweet and DM each other until Vaughn was eventually arrested in November of 2012 for unlawful use of a firearm by a convicted felon, but would later be released in 2014. Now I'm telling you all this for a reason. I hope you're keeping up. We're gonna put a pin in this for now. So at some point, Jakara becomes a killer for hire. A DM exchange with her and another young man was exposed with a man wanting to hire her to kill another popular rapper in the drill scene named Lil Herb, who has since gone on to change his name to G Herbo. She racked up so many bodies. According to A&E's Secret Life of a Gang Girl, let me pause there because that's the dumbest name in this situation. I don't even know what a &E was thinking and you'll see why later. But anyway, they allege that she was re directly responsible for unaliving 17 people by the time she was 17 years old. The streets say it's more like 20. And on April 11, 2014, Jakaira made a fatal mistake as she would tweet out her location, almost asking for death. In the weeks prior, she started making more introspective tweets talking about the demon she was battling and tweeting that if her father was alive, she knew things would be different. As a side note, I wonder if the constant threat of death wanted to make her expedite the process and speed up the inevitable. 
knowing she was the biggest game trophy her ops could have had, weighing heavy on her heart. That, along with all the blood spilt by her own hands, it just makes you wonder. But on that night, Ja'Kyra and two of her friends were walking to a friend's house to celebrate the birthday of another one of their fallen comrades when an armed gunman hopped out of the car and started letting off shots. Her two friends would be hit, sustaining non-life-threatening wounds to the leg and to the foot, respectively. It was obvious that Ja'Kyra was the big game they were after, being shot nine times in the neck, jaw, and chest. She stumbled to a nearby doorstep and ultimately succumbed to her wounds. 36 people would end up being shot after the murder of Jakara Barnes, with four ending in death, all within a 36 hour period. Now in a and 2019 Secret Life of a Gang Girl, they would go on to interview King Vaughn about his involvement with KI. Yeah, I was trying to first. I was like, damn, can you shit? The exact uh, text was something along the lines of, when it's all over with, I'm gonna get up in you or something. Does that sound about right? <laughs> that's something, that sound wrong, so yeah, I, I be saying wrong. Yeah, I probably did say that. I called the outside on the phone. Their budding relationship that they shared online as if it was just a Romeo and Juliet situation. You know, the Montagues and the Capulets. Two lovers that were just on the wrong sides of the tracks. Whole time, they might have been talking to Jakira's killer. The one known as the Demon of Obla. You see, on November 20th, 2020, King Vaughn would later lose his life to gun violence in Atlanta. At this point, he was a young rising rapper who seemed to have made it out of Chicago, being taken under the wing of Lil Durk, another more established drill rapper. When a beef led to an altercation outside of a nightclub, he would go on to be shot by another rapper's entourage. A year after his death, the Chicago police released documents related to several deaths involving King Vaughn, naming King Vaughn as the murderer in several cases. One of those murders he was attributed to was the murder of Ja'Kyra K.I. Barnes. Now, I wanted to say that these kids are evil, but that's too easy. It's easier to blame them than the system that they were brought into and the conditions that were manufactured to create this nonsense. Were they wrong? F***ing right. But who gave them the guns in the first place? Soldiers from Chicago charged with funneling guns from the Fort Campbell, Kentucky area where they're stationed to Chicago. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the three purchased 91 firearms, most in the past five months. Several of the guns were recovered after a pop-up party ended in a mass shooting here on 79th Street back in March. Eight people were shot, one died. Prosecutors say many other weapons used in recent shootings in Chicago have been linked to the empty firearm cases. Let that sink in. Tell me your thoughts in the comments. Was Jakira a serial killer? or just a misguided youth. I'll let you be the judge. Until next time.